Hi, my name is Ian Andreessen. I am uh, the CEO of Volino Tires. Uh, I live in Japan. Uh, that's where I'm based. That's where Volino is based. Uh, I've been in Japan now for 24 years and I've been involved with the Japanese drifting scene for about 12, 13 years, I'd say. Uh, I started out kind of, it was a funny situation there in the beginning. A D1 GP driver uh, mm -hmm. by the name of nickname of Drift Samurai yeah. wanted to, uh, to study English uh, so he, he would be able to travel the world more and communicate with other drifters in mm -hmm. other countries. And at the time I was uh, teaching English conversation as a part-time job, as a side job, mm -hmm. and his mechanic got in contact with me somehow. And at first I was like, who is this crazy guy that's always wearing the, uh, the samurai chomaga that they have? Mm -hmm. But he said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pro drifter and everything. Here's some tickets, come and check it out. And I went to my first D1 event in Ebisu like 12, 13 years ago. That was the first time I ever seen drifting. Mm -hmm. I've always been a fan of motorsports from the beginning, you know, going to NASCAR races in Pocono, which is uh, where I grew up mm -hmm. uh, in Pennsylvania. So I've always been into uh, motorsports in general, but that was just like, hey, even if I'm in Japan, I can still be involved with motorsports. So uh, after that, I was just, I started working with Samurai and his team. I became a member and then I found myself helping other companies and you know, helping the Drift King, uh, Mr. Tsiakechi himself and stuff like that. And luckily a few years ago, I was able to uh, get the opportunity to um, lead this, this new tire coming out mm -hmm. uh, by the name of Valino Tires. Okay, I totally went off subject, <laughs> just to introduce no, myself. No, no, I just want you telling stories. Okay. I think that you talking about, I don't know your history and I would bet almost no, none of our viewers know your history. Right. Um, I think you just chatting about stuff and me not talking is the best solution to this whole conversation. Okay. The things I love to hear, yeah. each time you, you say one little nugget, I just want to expand upon that. Like, okay. what was drifting at Ebisu like 13 years ago? Okay. What was it like being embedded with the samurai team and everything? Yeah. Where is he now? What is he drifting? Did he quit? Like, okay. what is it like for the aging population of Japanese drifters and all that stuff? Right. Are right. you just brought into Valino because you speak English and it's a great way for it to be a multinational business and you're in the right place at the right time and do you really have, doesn't sound like you have a lot of business experience like that. Right, correct. Sounds like you have English experience and they're yeah. using you for that, which is great. Yeah. Um, I don't know, expand upon any of those things. I, I would love to hear first about Ebisu 13 years ago, how it differs from then and now, and what your experience okay. was coming in. Because okay. you were probably a blank slate there, so you couldn't actually really absorb all of it anyways. You're right. just like, this is nuts. Yeah, that so, was, yeah. Talk to us. All Go. right, cool. Well, it's all you, man. The beginning, it was, um, yeah, the first time I went to Ebisu, I had no idea what was going on. I just saw a bunch of cars spinning around and burning their, you know, doing burnouts, and I was like, wow, that's really cool and everything. And, you know, I got really involved with uh, Drift Samurai's team. And of course, at the events, I was just trying to learn, you know, why is this good and why is this bad? And just being like Samurai's right-hand guy for a couple years mm -hmm. just gave me the experience to learn everything, the scoring systems and, you know, all about the cars and all about the tires and the tire pressures and, you know, all about this other stuff. 13 years ago, when I first seen that FD or the uh, D1 event in Abisu, oh man, those cars were mint. Mm -hmm but they're probably all less than half of the uh, horsepower range that they are today, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Like back then, I'd say, probably like 400, 500 horsepower was like the max. Mm -hmm. It was right before uh, Saito Daigo actually came out with all of the, the high power 2J, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it was really like the beginning of that high power, you know, um, ladder where everyone was just shooting for a thousand horsepower. Um, now, Drift Samurai is still drifting on the chassis that he's very well known for, which is the RX-7, the Mazda mm -hmm. RX-7. Um, he loves the FC body, but the FD is also, is obviously it's a better, it's an easier chassis to drift with. So he's currently building a F, an FD chassis with an FC uh, body on top. That's what he's working on now. Mm -hmm. I think he's gone through the years of his drifting career, I believe it's up to 28 RX-7s now. Whoa, that's crazy. It's kind of it's like- crazy he only had to use that many rotary engines to make it that long. Right. No, I'm joking. <laughs> he's never had a four rotor. Um, he's recently gotten up the opportunity to drive with a team that has a three rotor in, mm -hmm. their, in the vehicle. He's doing that this year. It's a, a team called uh, Mad Face. Mm -hmm. um, so he's doing that this year, but nothing professional. He's actually the, um, 
the team manager for for uh, Team Toyo Drift. For oh, really? D1. Okay. So that's kind of keeping him busy. You know, he's a talker, just like you. So he's a. Uh, you talk, not me. Keep going. <laughs> what was it like, specifically the Ebisu 13 years ago? Was it in a better condition? Was it less rundown, more rundown? Have they made a lot of renovations? Has the place changed a lot? Oh, it's changed a lot. There were there were no grandstands actually, uh, and after the the final turn there, mm -hmm. um, they only had the grandstand over near where the jump is. Uh huh. And everything else was just like dirt and mountains. So the, the condition of the track has, has improved a lot over the years. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually very, I have a very good personal relationship with Kumakubo, who's the owner of uh, mm -hmm. ABC Circuit. And he's constantly trying to upgrade the circuit. He has a lot of ideas. Mm -hmm. And hopefully in the future, this, the near future, we'll be able to work with him on a few of those ideas too. I was hearing they were going to do a banked corner on Nishi Long. Okay. Is that going to happen soon? He, he does want to put a bank in there, yes. That's going to be so cool. We don't mean like a NASCAR bank, we just mean like you come into a corner and it goes up a hill and comes back down, so it'd be a super cambered thing. Right. When you say bank, you think NASCAR. Right. This is just thinking like throw your car up a hill and come back down and transition. That's going right. to be so cool. Yeah, that would be awesome. You know, I think it's time that ABC did kind of upgrade and do something new. So tell me another story from Japan. Okay. Pick something. Pick something. What's the craziest thing you've done in Japan? Or, or you could talk about Nakamura or something. A lot of the audience likes to probably hear about him. How's his new car? How does he like it? Things like that. Because he went from someone that everybody was always like, oh, he just needs an SR20 and a stock engine and all this stuff and 200 horsepower. He does, you don't need that stuff. You don't need anything. And right. now he's like a thousand horsepower, big boy. Yeah. yeah. And he is like a savant at drifting. That guy is so good. So how's that going? Does he like his big power engine? Does he like doing all this stuff? Is he excited about that? Because he's becoming everything everyone said he wasn't, you know? Yeah. He's becoming professional. And I, I don't actually think that he likes it that much. Really? Yeah. Why not? It's not what he wants to do. He yeah. just wants to go out there and send it with his SR mm -hmm. in Mayhan Circuit. I think, honestly, that's what he likes. And that's why he does what he does. Mm -hmm. Just to keep that going, in a way, he kind of had no choice but to put a 2J and get a, uh, make a thousand horsepower vehicle if he did want to even have a chance to compete in D1 mm -hmm. in Japan. Does he need to, like, why does he have no choice? Couldn't he just keep doing all the other stuff or does he have to? Because one of the things I would say is everybody loved him from media. They've yeah. never talked to the guy. They don't share language with him. Right. Um, they just know him from cool videos at Mayhan and you see less media with his big horsepower car than you ever did with his beaters. Right. Um, and probably your company sponsored him and has stuff to do with him because of the media nature of him, because his team was extremely cheap. I'm putting words in his mouth, but I'd assume Nakamura was pennies on the dollar to sponsor because he wasn't very marketable from the perspective of a big company. You know, like the Japanese are very conservative people and he's very reckless where he got in trouble street drifting and taking his license away and couldn't compete professionally. Right. Is this stuff true? Yes. Or am I saying it wrong? Well, he's not cheap. Oh. <laughs> well, he would have been cheap for what compared you would think for skill Saito, level. I'm sorry. Uh, compared to Saito Daigo? Yeah. Yes. I guess he is a little bit cheaper than that. But, um, yeah, everything else he said is correct. He, he was caught street drifting. Uh, his license was taken away. And we actually offered to help him renew and get his license back. Mm -hmm. We actually had a camera crew go to the uh, license testing center <laughs> and we actually took video. We never put it out because that's personal stuff, but we just took video. We made this whole documentary about him going back to get his, his driving license. Mm -hmm. Of course, to get your D1 license, you need to have your normal driving license, mm -hmm. which was revoked also. Right. So he got his normal license back and then he got his D1 license and that's how he's entered back into D1 now. Um, he's also caused trouble in the US which is, I, from what I've heard, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that... Na Everybody in the comments can. Naoki Nakamura is the only driver in the world to be on uh, Formula Drift USA's blacklist. <laughs> I know of another driver, but I'm not going to name him. Oh, okay. So, but they're... Well, you corrected me then. No, it's probably the only... The other... Yeah, anyways, keep going. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's hard to... Uh, to bring Naoki uh, to other international events because of that, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people, a lot of countries that do have experience with him know him, you know, just for going in with his SR and just crashing the shit out of everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, 
and people love it, you know, that's the media loves it and everything, but there's another group of people that wants to be more professional about it that doesn't love it. But let, yeah, let's get back to uh, Naoki himself. He just loves trash in the cars and driving. He doesn't he doesn't love putting on the Valino t-shirts or the the low origin t-shirts and promoting product. It's just not his style. No. It's not what he does. So but he, that's almost good in some ways because he's the punk rock dude that's uh, I mean he doesn't have the punk rock style on himself as a human but in, you wrap him inside of a car and he is punk rock incarnate as a drifter. He is anti-establishment, he doesn't care about anything, he doesn't care about your nice D1 car, he doesn't care about your nice car crashing into it, he, he doesn't care about his stuff, you know what I mean? Like he's right. just completely in it for the love of the driving and is so, so, so good and talented yeah. that it's just magic watching that guy drive. Oh, it's a lot of fun watching him because you, you in a way you don't know what he's gonna do. He's mm -hmm. unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And yeah, his his style and his his uh, his way of driving, you can still see that even though he is competing in D1, which as you know, you know they use the the box. Mm -hmm. So everything is you know you have to clip the, the p clipping points and get the points. It's all about the points. It's not about style anymore, you know. But he's still somehow. Oh, I didn't think about that. He still somehow shows his Nauk, his end style and is able to qualify most of the events this year, which is showing something. He is someone that was really fast just road racing as well. Um, so that probably works really well in those points. So okay. he's not just a crazy drifter. Like I remember seeing some time attack stuff he did and he was fast behind the wheel, just okay. period. Okay. Was really good. So this you don't have to answer. You can stop and think about it for a second. Sure. But why is a company, Valino, who's trying to put a forward facing professional thing together saying you're a, one of the only companies in the world that's making drift specific tires before you make them you think about is this going to drift and then you make the tire not where like say for Kenda we love Kenda tires I'm not making this about Kenda but like it was a tire that was a different tire that worked incredibly well for drifting for yeah. long lasting all that stuff yeah. but it was they didn't make it for drifting you guys are making it specifically for drifting so you take yourselves very seriously you're very into the sport, you want to be at the highest level and everything. Why would you pick someone with like uh, Nakamura, who does not sit there and put on your shirts, does not play the game, does not promote the things how you probably want them promoted sometimes? Okay. Um, why would you deal with someone like that? Because there's probably a ton of other drivers there. Is it just because he's really good at having people point cameras at him and he's popular, or because I'm sure there's better drivers than him that you know just don't get cameras pointed at him because they don't have the crazy personality behind the wheel. What do you think? Okay, it's it's not, actually not that much of a, not that difficult a question. Um, and I think it's a good way just to kind of prove that we are a new company and we're trendy. Uh-huh. We're not like other companies, you know? Yeah, we are all for drifting, yes. And one way to help our audience and our fans and our, our future customers, hopefully, to understand that is to use people who are famous. Now, I don't want, I don't mean, okay. You don't want to use people that are famous. You want to work together with people who are famous. It could be because they're winning or it could be because they have a lot of followers. Mm -hmm. I think we need to balance that. And I think we are doing that pretty well with the drivers that we have chosen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had the opportunity to work with a lot of drivers. We could, probably could have worked with anyone in D1 mm -hmm. to be up, you know, uh, honest with you. Mm -hmm. We chose the drivers that we are working with and we actually cut that our uh, roster list in half mm -hmm. in 2020 compared to 2019, which was our first year in D1. Mm -hmm. uh, we also um, lowered the amount of uh, uh, the sponsorship that we were doing with uh, D1 mm -hmm. this year uh, because we wanted to step up and work with FD Japan and work with a couple other organizations at the same time. So it's all going to change again next year. So getting back to your question, which was... Um. Yeah, give me a choice of some questions that are dangerous. Mm. How about... What's it like being a... He's just going to do marketing speak when I ask him these. Um, I'll try not to. What's it like being a small tire company playing in a huge tire company's world? How do you get product made? This is not pre-stuff I know, by the way. I'm actually curious. Like, How do you get product made, deal with giant competitors, work with people around the world? Uh, this was not possible 20 years ago, I don't think. 
Uh, you could not have a tiny tire like Cottage Tire Company 20 years ago that could focus on drift marketing. Um, so that's one question, and you can choose to do that. Okay. Uh, like, how do you deal with bigger tire companies, and how do you focus? Where do you get tires made? What country? Okay. What are the obstacles with that? Or we could chat about. Um, oh, I had a second subject in mind, so I was going to give them choices. What was it? It was. Oh, if you guys are so punk rock and so trendy, yeah. Why do you continue to play the same game that professional guys do, but a little tiny bit more punk rock? When I say professional guys, I mean Toyo and these companies. Mm -hmm. I would say that most of their money spent in D1 and Formula D Japan or things like that yep. is replicated against multiple other companies and it gives you a chance to fail against them specifically because if your driver doesn't do well and doesn't podium, yep. you look at who's the, who's the number one team, probably Toyo maybe, and D1 Japan, who wins the most? Now? Yeah. This year, uh, or just say the last couple years. Ling Long, Toyo Tires. Yeah, really? they're, they're the strongest. I can't believe Ling Long wins. I don't know anything about Ling Long. But let's just say Toyo. They're like a juggernaut type yeah. thing. Yes. Why do you choose to fight them in a battle where they have more money, they have more development in tires because they're a super old company, not because you're bad, y'all are new. Right. Um, they have racing support going back a long time. They have 18 wheeler fleets. They have yes. marketing people. All this stuff. Why do you battle them? Why not just like, this is specifically to Nakamura. Why put him in D1 and let him not win against people or have him struggle? Where if you just had him at Mahon and all these other places and put him on like a drift week adventure like this or something and put a TV crew with him and all these things, yeah. his audience would love that type of content. This isn't saying he needs to do drift week, but that sounds cool. I, that was off the top of my head. Yeah. But you're creating instances for him to have magical experiences and always win in editing. You know right. what I mean? Like when he's riding the wall at Mahon, no one cares he's in comp. They only care that he's creating cool media and looking rad. And he's also not doing it on his own channel so it doesn't look forced. Yeah. Everybody's creating the media for him because they love him, which means you're having all the media created for free externally and then tagged because they love him, uh, which is the same thing kind of like Daigo a lot of the time. Daigo doesn't even make his own content. Everybody right. just points cameras at him. So if you chose the correct person that was punk rock, did all these things and set him in situations where he could succeed in media, I feel like you would have better bang for the buck with your marketing than you would in D1, specifically because there you can lose. Other places you can't. All right, I want that answer. The other answer is dumb about, or question's dumb about focusing on the manufacturing process and how to make it work. Okay. Do that one. That one's harder, isn't it? Wait, wait, wait. Do you get to spend the money and make the choices? Uh, some of them. Okay. I have, I have a, quite a say in what does go on okay. internationally. <clears throat> I don't have a say what goes on in, J in Japan. Okay. <clears throat> so everything that's decided uh, with it for marketing and everything like that within Japan, we lo I leave up to we leave up to our staff, our Japanese staff. Okay. Um, Sorry if I throw you under the bus with these things. <laughs> no, um, can you give me the question again, like simply? Why do you play the exact same game the bigger tire manufacturers play with a smaller budget, with less resources, giving them an opportunity to beat you when you could take the inherent advantages of Nakamura where you choose to place your money, which is grassroots media and letting everyone do all the work for you and it being organic and fun why don't you place him in situations like that instead of in competitive D1 scenarios? Because I believe he's better known for his Mahon videos and things like that than he ever was for professional drifting. Bam. Okay, first of all, me hearing that question twice now, it kind of has given me the vibes that you don't want Nelke to be in D1. Oh no, it doesn't matter to well. me. <laughs> well, I'm just talking about we have the money spent. Right. Every dollar, you guys are a small yeah. company, you gotta think about them. Tell me how you think about okay. this. Uh, first of all, we have a long relationship with Naoki. It hasn't just started since Volino. We've, we've, our mother company who owns Volino has had a very long relationship with a lot of D1 drivers. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Including Naoki Nakamura. So this, in a way, was a chance to help Naoki get back into the professional world. And obviously he wanted to, or he wouldn't, he wouldn't have gone that way. A little bit earlier I said he doesn't like it. He doesn't like the professional side of it. Mm -hmm. He likes the, the competitive the side. The competitive side of it. Yeah. He likes, you know, drifting against his boys, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, why do we do it? Why Naoki, you know, when we're going up against Toyo and all these other companies who have all these other tires, they have their truck tires, they have their 4x4 off-road tires, and everything else. 
just this our strategy is just different than all the other companies because we're small there's things that we can do for the drifting community mm -hmm. that other tire companies wouldn't think of or wouldn't waste their time on right so we're taking advantage of that such as such as uh, the amount of merchandise that we that we make like personally you know with Abo Moon or with Naoki mm -hmm. or with Sayaka or with Mickey or with Andrew Gray with all these drivers like on a personal level mm -hmm. like I don't think Toyo is going to go out and make you know Kawabata Masato uh, hand fans and you know they might make a t-shirt and a cap but that's like the end of the story so you're monetizing those merchandise items to make money to go do the racing yes it's 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 more so to it's all just branding to us that's what it is okay. like a comp we feel that a company that is supporting a large array of drivers would mm -hmm. get that much more support from the viewing audience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does, but I think that you guys are doing a bunch of interesting things like making tires specifically for grassroots drifting and higher wear counts or whatever, tread wear, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and some of those types of things maybe don't get displayed in D1 and stuff. Right. And you could be marketing those in ways that make sense to the viewers because you organically have those opportunities through Nakamura and other people and you're pushing them towards the competitive side. Oh, hey, this is a great way to ask that question also. Yeah. How many sticky, like, what do you, what's your stickiest compound? 140. Whew. 140 versus your hardest compound for drifting stuff. Uh, 360. 360. What is the spread in sales between those two? Who buys more of what? There goes an 800 horsepower drift car. Towards it. Uh, the popular tire uh, compounds and yeah. sizes is different in each country. Yeah? Yeah. Um, 255, 35, 18, and 255, 35, 17, 360 treadwear tires. Like, I'd have to say, like, 70% of our total sales have all been in the U.S. of that 360 treadwear tire. Okay. Like, no one else in the world needs or wants that. And is Mike from Mike Jang bringing all those in? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. Wow. So Mike is doing the majority of the sales in the world for that specific for tire. The, for the Gariva, for that size. Yes, okay. that's correct. Yeah. Cool. Keep going. I'm learning, so keep yeah. going. I'm absorbing. Um, and when you go to Europe, then, we have a few uh, distrib distributors set up in Europe. The UK, France, uh, Hungary. It's a lot of the, the grippier tires, so the RS, which is a 160 treadwear. That's mm -hmm. a very popular tire, uh, of course, because you have a lot of uh, guys running DMAC, mm -hmm. Drift Masters, mm -hmm. that want the winning tire. So in the US, they can't run the Valino, even, even if they wanted to. They can't run the Kenda either mm -hmm. for competition because it's not allowed, you know, in Formula Drift. Mm -hmm. So all we can do is work with the tires that, that all of our other guys, the grassroots drivers, can run and want to run up until that pro-am where there you know mm -hmm. there's no point really in doing it after that because you can't mm -hmm. we still have some supporters who will run anything other than fd they'll run volinos you know because they have that choice that's their choice which is cool but yeah kind of going off topic there so yeah every market is totally different size wise and treadmill do y'all sell more volinos in the u.s or to japan Oh, hands down, Japan. Okay. Yeah. I probably have a thousand tires coming in every month in Japan. Mm hmm So how many tires... Oh, we don't have to ask you all the personal questions yeah. about how many tires you sell a year worldwide no, and all that stuff. No, let's not go there. Let's I can say good. something cool about that there, yeah. which was surprising to myself. Um, compared to last year, international sales of Valino has doubled this year, mm -hmm. which is really cool because it just shows you know how much time and effort I put into last year to broaden internationally the brand has actually worked where I've been able to sell double, mm -hmm. even though it was uh, beeped up here. <laughs> this is my yeah. first international travel mm -hmm. of 2020, and probably my last. Um, I'm uh, what you call it? I'm uh, honored? blushing. Yeah, honored that they came out to hang out. It's really cool too because um, this isn't. This can be construed as two ways. You guys are small enough to care about drifting on the grassroots level because it is your bread and butter. And most tire companies are 
all right, this is terrible. They're too big and successful and like all huge and all this stuff to worry about that because they can't worry about small numbers. Right. Because they've gotten so big. You guys are in a very core area where you can develop drift specific tires. You can do things and you can be a part of the community. You can travel to those events because it is your bread and butter, but you haven't expanded to that size that gets huge yet. But when you do expand to that size, you'll eventually lose that. You can't send the CEO out to this for two weeks. He came to Drift Week for two weeks. That is the most irresponsible thing for a CEO of a <laughs> company to do. Because, <laughs> I mean, you're not working, not are you? Start. I'm working my ass off. Are you? <laughs> no, but I mean, like, you're doing Drift Week stuff. No, oh, I'm still doing all the other really? stuff every night Holy when I cow. go to the hotel. So I'm saying you're yeah. in a very cool place as a company where you're in rapid growth. You understand exactly what's going on in the market at the time it's happening and you're right. developing stuff. Right. And I think that as a company grows and gets bigger and whether it be successful, because huge companies that are successful can lose a billion dollars a year. I'm right. not saying it from that perspective. I'm right. saying y'all are in rapid growth mode and stuff. Yeah. Um, you will lose that magic eventually. You cannot send the CEO of a huge company somewhere for two weeks to go on a drifting adventure like this. Right. That would be crazy. So you're in a magical place that's unique at the moment yeah. in forming of the company. Right. Um, and that can't last forever. Yeah. Um, that's true. That's kind of cool when you think about that. It's awesome. I'm 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 really yeah. happy. You know what I'm what I'm able to do. Yeah. Which is what I love, and you know, come back to the U.S. and travel to other countries around the world. Um, which is pretty cool to fill up your passport and just meet a lot of other people mm -hmm. from around the world and make friends. It's yeah. It's, it's really a lot of people envy me and think that I'm not doing anything. Well, obviously I'm doing a lot of work, <laughs> but you know, someone has to do it. Someone has to put it out there, and someone has to shake the hands and stuff like that. But yeah. It's, we've been very productive and my travel has been very productive and that is showing in the numbers, like I said. Mm -hmm. I, I sold double of last year, even with a beeped up thingy going on around the world. Mm -hmm. 